draft is just hours away, and there are a lot of options to choose from. So we go through our personal big board and where we stand on prospects like Devin Carter, Deron Holmes, Rob Dillingham, and many more. Plus, how does Cleveland's hiring of Kenny Atkinson impact Miami's hope of landing Donovan Mitchell? We'll find out on today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, you are Locked On Heat, your everyday podcast on the Miami Heat. Whether you're tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app, thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day, Monday to Friday. I'm Wes Goldberg, editor at allyoucanheat.com, here with David Ramil. Both of us are credentialed Heat media members, and we have a big announcement to share with our listeners. If you haven't caught it on social media already, uh, David and I will be at the Miami Heat's official NBA draft party at Vivo at Dolphin Mall Wednesday. The event starts at 7. The first round kicks off at 8 o'clock. Uh, we'll be able to watch the first round, have some drinks, have some food, live entertainment, heat dancers, Bernie, giveaways, all sorts of things <laughs> that you would expect with a official Miami Heat watch party. And then David and I, which... Maybe you wouldn't expect that a Miami Heat official watch party, but they were nice enough to invite us there, and we are more than excited to accept the invitation and record a live show from the site after the Heat pick at number 15. Meet you, talk to you, discuss the Heat's offseason. So uh, if you're in the area, uh, please come on down, weather permitting, as long as it uh, holds up there. Yeah, no, it's exciting. I'm, I'm curious to see. We've never done something like this. Either we're doing a recap from the arena, but never like – a live event as something is taking place like i mean we've done like the end of games before but usually those are miami wins and we just go immediately and do a live show but to be there to to see the tension of the draft potential mm -hmm. trades so much more that could be taking place during the the watch party and we get to be there with the miami heat and with all of you it's so exciting yeah, and people get to watch us make mistakes as uh, as we are not what? sure what happens with the heats. Like they're going to pick something at 15 and then trade it away five, 10 minutes later or something. It, it There's potential for disaster, which is always good. Um, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as the playoffs wind down. The sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everybody every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. So before we get to our official Our Guys big boards, or just basically our favorite players in the draft, uh, and then we're going to review some of our results of our Twitter poll, let's talk about the Cavs hiring Kenny Atkinson, which was reported on Monday. They are nearing a deal. And what this means for Donovan Mitchell. According to The Athletic, the Cavs are preparing to offer Donovan Mitchell after they complete the signing of Kenny Atkinson uh, a four-year $209 million max contract extension for Mitchell. Uh, here's a quote from the athletic story. Atkinson is an offensive minded coach who values ball movement and diversity in his attack. Things Mitchell craves end quote. So David, obvious question here. Do you think that the Atkinson hiring increases the chances of Donovan Mitchell staying and Cleveland, and then obviously not being an option for the Miami heat to trade for this summer? It's hard to know exactly how much input from the reports. It seems like Mitchell did quote unquote sign off on the Atkinson hire. I think as their valued player and the guy that they're trying to keep, do you want to make sure that these go, these things get approved by Donovan and that he has some input, but we don't know exactly how much, I mean, there's not like a closer connection to him and Atkinson there that will necessarily require him or that he'll feel obligated to stay there. Like yeah, at this point, He's probably made up his mind. I don't know how much mm. of an impact the Atkinson hire actually has. Either he wants to play in Cleveland and he's happy just taking his money and going, or he wants to go somewhere else. And I think he's probably already decided that. And it's just a matter of deciding whether or not he can force a trade at some point soon. And and, and if he wants to leave, that being a, an option. So mm. otherwise, I, I think it's a, it's a fine move for Cleveland. And it certainly doesn't help. We saw already that he's worked very well with Jared Allen in Brooklyn. We saw him take a team of young talent and make them a really nice, fun, playoff-bound team. And then they crapped the bed completely and traded for superstars that were either unhealthy or didn't necessarily want to stick around 
for the rebuilding process and, and for trying to make a push to the finals. And then, of course, Brooklyn wound up not really doing much of anything of note over the last couple of seasons without right. Atkinson. But he had them on the right path. I think he's a smart assistant coach, smart head coach, and he should be a good fit there. So if anybody's going to get the most out of that team, if what we're hearing from J.B. Bickerstaff was that, uh, you know, that maybe he wasn't quite the uh, X's and O's minded coach that might necessarily have maximized the talent on that roster, I feel confident in saying Atkinson's much more capable in that yeah. regard. To your point about the Brooklyn experience before they went and got Kyrie and Kevin Durant and all that stuff, he did maximize that roster. That also had Karis LeVert on it, by the way, too. So he's got two of those former Nets now on this team. He basically got Karis LeVert and Jared Allen's career on track. Jared Allen was a first-round right. pick, much younger in his, but still. And so, but this trade isn't about Karis LeVert and Jared Allen. They could still turn around and trade those guys. It doesn't really matter. But it's about Donovan Mitchell. I do think that Kenny Atkinson, having spent a few years under Steve Kerr, can come into Cleveland and say, hey, look, I've got this experience under Kerr. I had this experience in Brooklyn. You can trust me. I got, I've got all this ball movement stuff. If you want to play like the Warriors did, I have, I have the playbook right here. Like we could do that. We could do our best version of that or, or tailor it to something that makes sense for you and for us. Two things though. Number one, it looked like they were pretty far down the path with James Borrego before mm -hmm. Gilbert kind of came in and said, I kind of want Kenny Atkinson. Go ahead and hire that guy. I do wonder how much, if Donovan Mitchell wasn't necessarily involved, but signed off, did he sign off on Borrego? And they were down, How it depends on how deep that, how, how far down that path they were with Borrego. Uh, and does this come as maybe a shock or something unexpected for Donovan Mitchell in terms of Gilbert swooping in and saying, no, go ahead and hire Atkinson. I want that guy instead. Yeah. No way to know. So that's just one thing that's just sort of looming over there, kind of whatever. All, the second thing is, I don't know how much any of this matters. I truly don't know what superstar in the NBA gives two bleeps about who the coach of their team is. Like, I, <laughs> I don't know that there's a player out there that says, yeah, you know what? Now that you hired that guy, I was prepared that's to demand a trade. But because you hired that guy, now I'm staying. Right. I don't know that a su there's a superstar in the league that feels that way. I would actually go so far as to say I'm pretty sure there isn't one. So um, does that mean anything? I don't know. The other reporting coming out of Cleveland all along, though, for the last month is that they're really optimistic that they're going to be able to sign down to Mitchell. And I've said this before, but that sounds like when you, when you ask yourself, when you read these leaks and you ask yourself, okay, who's, who's leaking this stuff? Who does it benefit? That, those leaks sound like they're coming from Cleveland's front office. I don't imagine that Donovan yeah. Mitchell's out here telling reporters, yeah, Cleveland feels really optimistic about signing me to an extension. Like that doesn't help him in his leverage and getting the max or whatever right. it is. It doesn't really help him. Right. He's not doing that. So until I hear something or see something from Donovan Mitchell, I don't necessarily believe those leaks either. But I do know this about Donovan Mitchell. He's a guy that's committed to the team he's on. If you watched Cleveland in this playoff run, he went all in for winning. He never demanded to get traded from Utah. He might, and he never really told them I wouldn't resign there either. That was like that was not really timing wise didn't really matter for them. Danny Ainge was the one that wanted to blow that thing up. He pushed the big red button. He's the one that traded Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell has been committed to whatever team he's been on the entire time, which is why, by the way, he's such a great fit for the Miami Heat. But all those things go hand in hand is like, wow, this guy's got such a great personality. Wouldn't it be great to have him here? But yet that's the guy that usually stays on his team where the players that don't stay on their teams, the Kyries and the James Harden, Heat fans are like, we don't want anything to do with those guys. But at least those guys are demanding trades and getting themselves to new places. Well, you know what I mean? So it's sort of like yeah. the two, two ends of the, the sword there. But I did want to ask you this, not knowing what's happening with Donovan Mitchell, we have heard some stuff now about Paul George. Because mm -hmm. I think if you're looking at backup options, if Mitchell is not one, I, I don't, you and I agree that Trey Young's probably not realistic. I just don't see Atlanta trading their face of the franchise within the division. Uh, we could talk about the Larry Markinens and the Zach Levines and stuff like that, but that's not at the same level as Donovan Mitchell, Trey Young. Like, that's just, that's not ne moving the needle nearly as much as those guys. But Paul George arguably could. And, if the report, all the reporting around the Clippers right now is that Paul George might actually just opt into his contract as opposed to become request a free a agent and then request a trade, which would obviously open up a whole slew of options where in free agency, it's basically the 76ers are bust. And by the way, the, the Clippers could still move Paul George to Philadelphia in a trade, just like, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. They have all the cap space still. But what do you think about Paul George as a potential option for Miami? 
I don't like it on the surface. I think he's a good fit in terms of what his talent is and what he can do. But I, I think, assuming okay, assuming a trade for Paul Paul George probably requires Miami to either trade Jimmy Butler straight up or, or include him in the trade to Los Angeles, or is your assumption that you'd be acquiring Paul George to complement Jimmy and Bam? The idea would be to add Paul things. George, add Paul George to Jimmy Butler and Bam. But the Jimmy Butler swap now, that's interesting. Let's uh let's go down that path a little bit more. Let's do it after the break. What do you think? Hmm. Good tease. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Look, you love sports. You wouldn't be listening to this show if you didn't. And if you love them as much as I do, you want them to never stop. But as the playoffs are winding down, the NBA and the NHL, who knows at this point it could be panthers nhl champs that would be nice we get fewer games of course there's major league baseball but the sports aren't sportsing like you want them to but FanDuel lets you keep the sports going wherever you want all you have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime you're in the mood and this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily that's right daily there's something for everyone every day all summer long so head over to FanDuel dot com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of major league baseball we'll be right back thanks for making locked on heat your first listen every day miami heat talk every day five days a week if you're new to us on youtube hit that subscribe button you can also follow us on your favorite podcast app like i said five days a week all off season long including this week where we are going to have a ton of draft content for you. We'll have our mock draft later on uh, before Wednesday night's first round. Obviously, our recap of the first round from the Miami Heat's watch party. And then on Thursday, our recap of the second round. So definitely keep it locked in here. Before we get to the guys we love in the NBA draft, uh, we mentioned the Paul George thing. So... My when I when I asked this to you, I was thinking, okay, instead of Donovan Mitchell, you just get Paul George, you add him to Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo. It's not necessarily adding a guard, but it's still you know a top sure fifteen to twenty player when healthy. I mean, I he, did he make All NBA? I, he was an All Star last year. I think he was on the All NBA shortlist. Seventy four games last year at twenty almost twenty three points per game. I mean, there's there's times where Paul George looks like one of the best ten players in the NBA, right? Like he could just mm-hmm. turn it on sometimes. Contract-wise, it would be tough. So the Clippers are that second apron team. Miami's right up against that second apron. It's going to be tough, but if there's any two front offices that could figure out a way to work around it, it's Miami's insanely smart front office and the Clippers' very smart front office, right? Like, these are two of the smarter front offices in the league in terms of just figuring out way. Like, who? I didn't even see them getting being able to pull off the James Harden deal from a cap yeah. perspective. They, they, You know, these are two front offices that That's pull stuff it. off. So I was thinking, like, I don't know, would it be – Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson, that gets you right at that Paul George salary plus whatever the three first-round picks are, maybe, something like that. Maybe you throw in a Jaime Jaquez or a Nikola Jovic to something like that, really move the needle for the Clippers. I don't even know if they're able to do that considering where they are on the second apron. That would take them mm-hmm. over the Paul George salary where Hero and Duncan Robinson would keep them under the Paul George salary, which is a second apron team you have to do, but again, who knows. Um so, I don't know, maybe that's something that's interesting to the Clippers, because if you're letting Paul George walk, you're kind of hitting the reset button a little bit, yeah. but at least you're bringing yeah. back guys like Hero and Duncan Robinson, who are playoff experience Bridge the gap. players. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, obviously, you'd rather keep Paul George, I would imagine, but whatever. So, uh, but then the option, well, let's start there before we get to, like, the Jimmy Butler swap. Like, what do you think about that? If you're able to acquire him with Jimmy Butler, this team, then it makes a lot of sense because I mm-hmm. think that kind of keeps the window open. Like George, you know, obviously injury could always be a concern and you never know with Paul George who's missed some games. Jimmy Butler obviously having missed some games. Miami doesn't get any healthier. And if health was a major concern last year and certainly was, then you're certainly not guaranteeing anything by acquiring Paul George. But on the assumption that, let's say, you can ride out the regular season, stay relatively healthy, and manage to escape the play. And yet again, maybe I, I, if that all ha- breaks for Miami, I like their chances in the playoffs because I think that's a good, balanced team with playoff experience. And I, I think it makes a lot of sense. You've got your closer in Jimmy. You've got your star in Bam and Abayo doing everything that he can on the floor. And then Paul George, certainly as an offensive and defensive player, is, as you said, one of the top 10, 15-ish players in the league at this point in time. So... I think that's a great place for Miami to kind of continue to build. And if, if unfortunately, if it just costs you Tyler and or Duncan, 
I think that's you know that's a that's a great combination. I, you can still weather that, and you're still able to keep some of the young players on this roster, plus whatever you might be able to get in the drafts, etc. Well, you probably have to include. A, the, I would imagine you have to include. You the might, picks, you might but, have to, you might yeah. have to. But you know, who knows? Who knows how it works out? I mean, again, I think this might be a little premature. I, I really, it is, no, it definitely I hadn't is. even considered. I hadn't even considered the idea of acquiring Paul George to compliment Miami. I, I thought, if anything, it might be something that it would be like again because the Clippers. Well, they need their championship window open longer than Miami does in many sense. As frustrated as Heat fans could be, well, the Clippers have never even sniffed at the championship. I don't think they've even – have they ever one even Western, been in the finals? No, one Western Conference yeah. finals. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're, they need a championship that much more. And if that's the case, they probably want Jimmy Butler. You know, it keeps, puts Jimmy in L.A., So keeps that window open. That's the interesting part. I, I kind of hate – if you were to do a Jimmy for Paul George swap, I think it makes both teams worse. Right, because if you're Miami, you're still getting a player with health concerns. Yes, Paul George played 74 games last year, but in the four years the Clippers before that, never cracked 57 games in a season. Like this guy is always hurt. The difference with Jimmy Butler always being hurt and Paul George always being hurt is like once the playoffs come around, you got playoff Jimmy. Where playoff P, I'm gonna go on a limb and say, isn't necessarily at the same level as playoff Jimmy. (laughs) I think that's fair to say. If if he even exists at all. (laughs) Right, yeah whatever, the, yeah, whatever Paul George does become in the playoffs is not the Super Saiyan transformation that happens when Jimmy Butler gets to the playoffs. So, yeah, uh, it just like you're sort of just dealing with the same BS in the regular season without the potential reward in the postseason if you're the Heat. Right. And then if you're There's the no payoff. And then if you're the Clippers, Jimmy Butler's lack of three point shooting, the spacing, like all the stuff that Paul George does bring next to Kawhi yes. and James Harden and stuff. Yes. Jimmy Butler does not do that. And all the Paul George being like, hey, I'm cool just being the second and even the third option on some nights when James Harden decides to wake up and care about basketball. Yeah. I don't know that Jimmy Butler's cool with that, too. Jimmy Butler's going to walk in there and be like, uh, this is my team now. Like, he's he's the alpha in that locker room, I think. So it, it's yeah. sort of weird and not great for both teams. However, the one thing that does work out for the Clippers, not for the Heat in this trade, and not to get too far down this salary cap rabbit hole, but one of, the, I guess, the, the, the hang-ups with, the Clippers and for Paul George is Paul George wants that extra year. He's eligible because of whatever his age is and whatever for another year that Paul, that Jimmy Butler isn't eligible for, right? Jimmy Butler, if he were to decline the player option, he's eligible for another year on top of it. So a three-year extension. Paul George is eligible for a four-year extension. The Clippers signed Kawhi to a three-year extension. They don't. They want to keep that the books clean after Kawhi is off the books. And that, right. I guess, is part of the hang-up with Paul George is he wants all the years. Well, Jimmy Butler's not eligible for four years. He's not allowed to sign that many. He's only allowed a maximum of three years. So no matter what, if the Clippers said, well, we'll just give you the full max, we know that after three years, we're off the Kawhi deal and we're off the Jimmy Butler deal. So from a financial aspect, it could make some sense for the Clippers. That said, I heard, I think, Zach Lowe and maybe Bobby Marks talking about this. And because these are both basically operating as second apron teams, it's it, it's like almost impossible to make the math work here. So... For all those reasons, I think you hit it on the nail on the head before. It is a little premature. With that said, let's move on to okay. our guys, David. We have done a ton of blue notebook draft prep. We have scouted countless players coming up in the NBA draft. And so what you and I have both prepared here is not necessarily, I don't think, unless you viewed it differently, I don't think these are the, just the best players in the draft. That's not yeah. how I view my These are the guys that I just like a lot. These are my favorite players in the draft with obviously a sense of with the Miami Heat involved here, right? I think like these will also mostly be good fits for the Heat. So these are my favorite players in the draft. These are your favorite player uh, players in the draft. We'll start with your list. Who were, sure. who's, who's at the top of your guys, the our guys big board, the your guys big board? I'm still moving on. I think Devin Carter is still uh, the best option for Miami. We had an opportunity not to let the cat out of the bag, but we had an opportunity to do the mock draft for the network in general. Devin Carter somehow slipped for us, and I think both of us kind of <laughs> what's, jumped what's in the uh, No, no. What's the uh, what's the um, Adrian Wojnarowski verbiage? We we were excited at the proposition of adding a talent such as Devin Carter at, with the fifteenth pick in the draft. Yes, yes. Or, or we're thinking of we were thinking of selecting. Yeah. Anyway, yes. uh, the, <laughs> there's so many different options, but yeah, Devin Carter was there, and we were like, "Yep, that's the right fit." So I think if you're getting again, like there was that interesting piece by Tom Haberstroh that came out recently, looking at at superstar level potential from the draft, like the one correlation being that 
you know, you have, you're the son of a former NBA player. Well, that's not necessarily a guarantee. And I'm looking at, you know, players like Tim Hardaway Jr. and others. It certainly helps. And a guy like Carter that does have those intangibles and tangibles and an understanding of the Miami Heat organization, he's number one on my list. So that was a pretty easy choice for me. I also had Devin Carter at the top of my list. Uh, I love this guy. I love the competitive nature with him. I've listened to interviews with him. I can listen to that guy talk about basketball all day. He needs to be in Miami's yeah. locker room. Uh, <laughs> I just, I would enjoy it so much. Um, he's also, I do, I think the son of the coach stuff really matters. Like Clay yes. Thompson, Steph Curry, even like, I know we like look at Tim Hardaway Jr. He's had a long NBA career. That's not nothing. He's in the NBA. You know? like, like, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't, yeah, that counts time, something. And not just a flash yeah. in the pan, right? Like, yeah. there's, you've got to know how to stick around and you yeah. learn those kinds of tricks of having to be a good locker room presence because nobody's ever said a bad thing about Tim Hardaway Jr. other no. than what he does on the court. Like, that's just something fans get frustrated with. As far as the locker rooms, he's been popular in New York, Atlanta, and now in Dallas. He's loved there around the league. Yeah. That's how you stick around and keep getting those checks. And just like all those intangibles is enough for me to buy in. But then yeah. you consider also that he shot 38% from three point range last season, and steadily got better from three point range. And I would expect in Miami that would only continue to get better. And guys who want to put the work in, like a Devin Carter, they just get better as shooters. That just happens. So I'm not worried about the shot, even if anybody is worried that last year was a little bit fluky from three point range for him. The catch and shoot numbers, by the way, are very good for him. And he was, yeah. for, he was forced a lot into sort of grenades at the end of the shot clock because that Providence team was not awesome. So like yeah. I can like there's so many like last four seconds of the clock teammates just throwing it to him like hey you figure it out like there's just a lot of those you know he's and perfect so, in Miami then he's right, probably exactly all, hey, all we do is play in the last five seconds of the shot clock um <laughs> so uh so you add all that the fact that he might be the best perimeter defender in the entire draft and that point. he's the best athlete in the draft and it's not even that close. Looking at how he tested out at the combine and what the analysts are saying, like the people, the scouts who watch this guy in person, like this guy might be the best and probably is the best athlete in the draft. So you've got all the intangibles and all the coaches stunts up, but the fact that he's the best athlete and all these things, perimeter defender, I love it. If he slipped to 15, I think it's a no brainer. I think I would be mortified if he did slip to 15 and Miami for some reason passed on him. He's my favorite player in the draft. He's your favorite player in the draft. We'll continue with our, our guys, big boards after this unlocked on heat. Thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube. Let us know what you think the Heat should do in Wednesday's first round. Also, let us know what you think about the Donovan Mitchell situation, the Paul George situation. You can do that in the comments here on YouTube. Also, follow us on your favorite podcast app. Before we get to some of our Twitter polls here, David, continuing along with our big boards, give me the rest of your top five. Top five here. I've got... Carter, obviously, at one. Keyshawn George at two. Jacoby Walter at three. Khalil Ware at four. And Deron Holmes at five. Oh, you, so you did end up going, getting on the Deron Holmes bandwagon a little bit there. A little bit. A little bit. I, I think yeah, he just makes a lot of sense. And, and, like, you're not adding the, quote, unquote, necessary size that you might want. Like, not the huge body, but he's big enough. And he's physical. And I think he can rebound well he can space the floor a little bit he, he, he just he seems to have a good feel out on the floor knowing how important that is for Miami it seems like that would be a nice fit whether he, he doesn't necessarily replace Bam but playing alongside him that's a much bigger lineup even now with Nico at mm -hmm. seven feet you could go all three you could put Nico at the three Deron Holmes at the four yeah and Bam at the five that's a good lineup there he's a real big right and even with Jovic yeah. kind of trying to become a real big I wouldn't <laughs> qualify him as a real big in the NBA yeah. like he's he's yeah. versatile and that's really cool but I wouldn't you know Bam Adebayo is really the only every night like every down back in the front court that the Heat have and I feel like if you added a guy like Deron Holmes he could play the four and the five a little bit like a Nas Reed type thing and if you add one more guy to that front yeah. court yeah the makings of a pretty good trio there I've got Deron Holmes number three on mine but I think the surprising thing for me is you had Keyshawn George this high, the UM guy. Why did you have him number two? I just think he's got star potential as a shooter and scorer. And I think you're looking at a guy from Miami. You know, there's a connection there. He's so young. And he. Yeah. I think he's got star potential. And for a team like Miami who has been so, well, bad offensively, they could certainly use the help. And while he might not be a guy that would contribute right away, I could see three, four years. Like Miami just hasn't 
they haven't ever drafted a guy like that. Just a swing for the fences kind of thing. And I, to me, he just makes a lot of sense with that potential. Like he could be a bust. And it mm-hmm. depends on where he's drafted because, again, with his youth, a lot of a lot of players and throughout NBA history have been drafted with all the talent in the world. But if they're in the wrong situation, or they hit the wrong coach, or they just don't get playing time, and they get in the doghouse, and next thing you know, they never develop. You know, I don't. I don't think Miami's going to do that with a player like that but at the same time i would want them to be able to maximize what he brings to the table so i, I like the potential more than anything of Keyshawn. super long six seven six eight longish wingspan at like six eleven ish uh has the ability to defend a little bit and switch and stuff at least the potential the tools to do it but a the knockdown shooter you shooter. already hit it like yeah. just an absolute knockdown shooter does pass over the top of the defense which i like uh, and I think the Heat are going to like the fact that he was coached up by Jim Laranaga. That's going to matter sure. to them. They're going to say, okay, this guy at least has some foundation. Now, he's on, you know, he spent a cup of coffee in college. He was there for a year. But at least he has a foundation there, and we do appreciate that. And if anybody's going to know about Keyshawn, Keyshawn George, it's the Miami Heat. Because Eric Spolstra and Jim Laranaga are legitimate friends who talk all the time. Like, right. they, they scout they're, He's in the backyard. Like, if I'm other teams, I'm calling the Miami Heat and I'm saying, what do you think about Keyshawn George? Because you have more information on him than anybody else. So um, I I didn't have him on my board, but that's not because I didn't think yeah. he was an option. There's just some guys that I liked a little bit right. more. Um, so you have Carter have... and Holmes at three. Who else do you have there in your list? So I have Ron Holland from the G League Ignite at number two Okay. okay. on mine. You didn't have him in your top ten. But the I more I watch this guy, I – love this guy like super inefficient <laughs> in his one year at the g league even inconsistent defensively even though his production his his playmaking stuff the stocks were off the charts steals blocks all that stuff was off the charts at the g league night there was moments where he looked like herb jones Kawhi leonard out there where he's just stealing the ball from guys taking it and running it down the other end but the heat have never had an athlete like ron holland this was a guy who was in the mix yeah. of the number one pick in the draft for a few months there before a really tough year with the G League Ignite, but that Ignite team sucked, and nobody was good on it. And it was a bad. It was. It was just a. It was. They had. No, I mean, no offense to our friend Norris Cole, but he was kind of running point for them at times. Like it was <laughs> not an awesome roster that, and it wasn't well coached. Um, with a bunch of kids still going up against adults, even in the G League, it was just a rough kind of situation for him. And I would bet that putting him in a much better situation like Miami, it would just yeah. go better. And Ron Holland isn't not, he's not a guy right now at this stage, and he's still very young, who should be the primary advantage creator on a team. And that's what he was asked to do for the Ignite. And he wouldn't not be asked to do that. In Miami, you say, hey, catch and shoot, defend your butt off, hustle for rebounds. I mean, this guy might have the big, the best motor in the draft. And so you watch him and you're just like, I respect how hard this guy plays. And I think the Heat would too. And he's huge. I mean, he, like, not huge, huge. But he's six seven with almost a seven foot wingspan, six eleven wingspan. The he he's got athleticism that the Heat probably haven't had since LeBron James, mm. in terms of just pure athlete. They have not had yeah. this high level of an athlete. And for everything that the Heat have done with guys like Caleb Martin and Haywood Highsmith who went undrafted, Ron Holland, as raw as he is, would be sort of like the ultimate ball of clay for this Miami Heat developmental program. It's like, okay, you turn yeah. Caleb and Haywood into rotation pieces. But now you have a legit elite top 1% athlete. Could you turn this guy into a star would be my question. And so I kind of like it as a swing for the fence kind of guy. And and again, you listen to him saying all the right things. Awesome character. Coaches rave about this guy. Like he sounds like a heat culture guy too. And I think he will, I think he'd probably, I mean, we know that the heat worked him out and I bet he crushed the interview. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I bet he crushed the interview just as much as Devin Carter crushed his interview. So I kind of like him as a fit. It's a, it's an interesting proposition. I, I also thought he might've been gone well before my, I know he's in definitely some could be slips yes. in Miami, but yeah, yeah, he's, some people have him like around 10 top 10 is certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it is an interesting, I just, I felt like Miami just needed so much more on the offensive end. And I just totally fair. I'm concerned about his ability to, get that and Miami has so many holes that they need filled that just getting what could potentially be a defensive special potentially he could have two way upside for sure if they maximize if they get him to de- and develop him but at this point since he's kind of just limited as a defensive specialist I don't know that Miami could take those 
a chance necessarily on bringing him aboard. But you know what? I, I, I'm happy to be wrong with a guy that, that shows all that energy and those intangibles that Miami certainly loves. It's why he's a my guy pick, right? It's just, yeah. I listen to him talk and I just love him. That's my guy. Yeah. You know, it's just, that's just a wall my guy. kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, all right. I'm going to show the graphic here on YouTube. So I'm going to give away the rest of our big boards. But why don't you go ahead and just pick one in your final sort of five here that, that you want to talk about? You know, I, I think I'll I'm list them off to warm with up. people on audio too. I'm oh. sorry. So six well, I've ten. got, uh, yeah, I've got, uh, after Holmes, I've got Jared McCain. Um, starting to come along on the idea of him getting, you know, as a great shooter and a guy that I think has some star, not star potential, but maybe, you know, he could be a really, really solid specialist for Miami. A guy who can play well, like defend well, he wins at everything. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's just going to be a good NBA player, at least in my yeah. opinion. He might not ever be a great one, but I, I'd like that possibility for a Miami team that certainly needs help at the guard position. I got Tristan De Silva after that. Zach Eady, I'm really warming up more. I was considering putting him somewhere close to the top five. I just, everybody talks about the motor and the aggression, and it, he's not just a stiff out there. Like, physically, he might be a little right. limited, certainly. But the guy just, he's not going to take crap from anybody. And Miami just hasn't had a bully like that. I, I can't recall when. Like, I mean, Chris Anderson was as close as it got, and he was more, like, <laughs> aesthetically scary than anything else they just haven't had a guy who just really intimidates people is it fair to I wonder call whether... him a better dexter Pittman? <laughs> uh i, I don't, don't think trash. So, I, no. that, that was a joke but i have zach ed4 i have zach ed4 the more i've actually gotten to kind of know this guy and watch this guy and, and it, it's that classic thing that that eric spolstra and coaches will always tell you is don't tell me what he can't do tell me what he can do Right. And this is like a very classic Bill Belichick line, too. Don't tell me what he can't do. Tell me what he can do. Well, I can tell you what he is. He's seven foot four with a seven foot ten wingspan and a nine foot seven standing reach or whatever it is. He's one of the yeah. largest humans on the planet. I know that for sure. And he's got incredible touch in the paint. He's flashed the ability to maybe extend, extend to the three point line. He gets fouled all the time because he's so huge. Uh, defensively, I just know that he's going to be able to protect the rim, even if he can be beaten when he gets out on the switch, but if you've got Edie in the middle and you're playing Bam off of him as a weak side kind of backside help defender, then anytime Edie gets beat, then you got Bam cleaning it up. So I'm less worried about it in Miami than I would be maybe in some other contexts too. So I like Edie a lot. I like the motor. I like the character. I like the fact that he also worked to slim down. Yeah. Even going into the draft combine and then worked yeah. on sort of the three shuttle cone drill thing with that, that one that, uh, uh, test your agility, your side to side agility. He, yeah. I, I think it's a little fake how well he did on the testing itself, but I like that he faked it. I like it's a fake until you make it thing. But to me, it's a self awareness of this is the questions NBA teams are going to have of me, and I'm going to do whatever I can to answer those questions in a positive way. And so I think that that's that's real, like, like that's real intrigue to me. That shows a real level of self awareness and stuff. Here's the other thing I like about him too durable. And despite his size, like great conditioning. The guy played 40 minutes a game in the tournament, never came off the floor. I mean, was yeah. just always out there and super productive. So there's just a lot of things that I, it's easy to kind of pinpoint the things that you don't like, but there's just so many things that I do like about him that I can't imagine he's going to be, I don't know that he's ever going to be one of the best elite centers in the NBA, but I know he's going to be in the NBA for a really long time. And at 15, sometimes that's all you're looking for. So who's the rest of your list then? So my top 10 is Devin Carter, Ron Holland, Deron Holmes the second, Zach E. I've got Rob Dillingham at number five. Yeah. I don't know how I feel yeah. about the fit in Miami, but I just really like watching that guy play. And if they took him, I wouldn't be like mad about it. You know what I mean? I'd be a little confused, yeah. but I wouldn't be upset. I've actually, and I thought you were higher on Bub Carrington than I was. The more I've watched him, the more I've liked him. I don't yeah. know that he's a good fit for Miami right now, but if they were yeah. to trade Jimmy Butler then I could see them bringing on Carrington as just a guy who, I'm not saying he's going to be the next Jimmy Butler, but just a guy who can play on the perimeter and be a legit bucket getter. Like, as good yeah. as Jaime Hakez and Nikola Jovic are, I wouldn't qualify them as bucket getters. Bub Carrington, if you lose Jimmy Butler, you're going to need somebody who could score buckets. And I like him. And I just like watching him play. I got Jacoby Walter at seven. You had him at three. We've talked about him before. Just ultimate three and D. Contavious Caldwell-Pope is a common comp for him. You and I kind of like those guys. It's not a surprise that he's on our boards. I got Eve yeah. Missy. I just like him. He's a run and jump athlete, really raw, but I like that he falls. Fo I like that he leans forward when he finishes, plays with strength, even if he needs to add strength. I like him almost seven feet tall. 
Uh, I don't know if I like him as a fit for Miami other than maybe a backup big. I don't think he's a guy that can yeah. play with Bam, but I just like him. Tristan De yep. Silva, you and I both have him. And then you and I both at our 10 spot have Adam Bona, the center out of UCLA, 6'8 with a 7'4 wingspan, also a high motor guy, super high basketball IQ guy. Uh, rebounds, can switch defensively. Just a lot of things you like about him. Probably doesn't top out as a high-level starting center, but could be like a really good backup for a really long time in the NBA. Probably not a yeah. first-round pick for Miami, I would say, but no. if he's there at 43, which it's looking like he's probably not going to be, yeah. I've, I've heard that he could be in the mix for the first pick in the second round at this point. Yep. So uh, might be off the board at 43, but just a guy that you and I like for obvious reasons. Yeah, oh, interesting options there. And I mean, there are so many other players, to be honest with you. I kind of tried to limit it to some degree to like the players that we've talked about that, that seemed like they were going to be obvious mostly available or likely available right. for Miami, either at 15 or 43. But there are a lot of other names there that I felt like we could have included there. But uh, anybody else that you thought maybe like, there's like an honorable mention on your list? Yeah, I had a few guys that I, I, I really like. I mean, Harrison Ingram, who's more of a second round pick. Is yeah, a guy that, that's really yeah. interesting to me. If I could throw we not we haven't talked about the top of the draft. I don't know how much homework you've done on it, but like if you just give me a name, you don't have to do like a whole scattering report, but like the Rissaches, the SARS, the Klingons, the 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 Reed Shepherds, like all these guys, like do you like any? Yeah, of these I know you're big on Reed Shepherd. It just feels like an opportunity for you to talk about Shepherd. No, I, I just I like game. his shooting. I like the I like the fact that he's got Schutzpa and he can shoot the ball. And I think there's I'll th tell you, teams that like that. The one thing I like about those top players of, of all of them, honestly, I've really not dug into it. I Sars mentioned of Bam Adebayo being a, a better player. I don't know if anybody saw this, but it went no. around on social media. He was asked. You know that, that that trend everybody's going through, like uh, hold your breath or don't say anything until you see the better player over a better player than Victor Webanyama. So they go off through a list of different players, and then when you get to Bam at a bio, he says him. Yeah, like like he believes that Bam at a bio is a better player than Victor Webanyama. So you know he's like appreciative of what right. Bam can do. And anybody oh, who heard, has that kind that's of that's my eye, guy. I've heard enough. Yeah. trade up for Alex Sar. I've heard enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Like I, again, I, I don't even know what he does on the floor, but the fact that he loves Bam that much. Yeah. <laughs> What's he play yeah. guard? I don't even know. No, I know he's a big man. I'm kidding. All right. Uh, real quick, we're gonna run through some of the Twitter polls that we've been running over here on Locked On Heat on Twitter X, whatever we call it these days. We asked you, should the Heat draft based on need or best player available? Not surprising. Eighty-one percent of you said they should draft the best player available fortunately for the heat they need everything so this is sort of you know whatever <laughs> it doesn't matter we'll get what we can get this one was a little surprising not because of who won but how big the difference was which center prospect do you prefer zach Eady or kalel Ware? 57 percent of you picked Ware over Eady. and again i'm not surprised i get it like i get like yeah. the theoretical thing on where i want to like Ware so much i really do and if the heat draft him i'll talk myself into it but sure. I watch him play, and I just I can't get there to where he is theoretically. But I understand why people like him. Uh, which forward prospect do you prefer between Ron Holland and Tristan uh, Da Silva? Sixty nine percent of you said Ron Holland. That might have been a little unfair, considering that Holland might not even be there. Da Silva figures to be there at fifteen, but um, Da Silva definitely has a lot but of fans. He's a better prospect, right? Like Da Silva yeah. is a guy who might be like a more immediate contributor because he, he does a lot of things pretty well. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly, it seems like it screams kind of a Miami type player, an older player, you know, he's 23 and, and uh, you know, kind of reminding every, a lot of people of, of what Jaime Hawkins was or how he was yeah. viewed, you know, like maybe not a high ceiling, but boy, you're sure going to get a guy who can play and do a lot of things. It's okay. <laughs> I like him. I, good. I like the Silva a lot. I like his basketball feel. I, I think it's a really underrated part of him and, and how we yeah. judge prospects in general. We kind of just like stick to running and jumping and how good are they at that those at those things. When we talk about ceiling, I think feel is a very underrated part of that. Like Jaime, exactly. Uh, but I still just love Ron Holland, so I pick him. Which guard yeah. prospect do you prefer between Devin Carter and Rob Dillingham? Fifty-seven mm -hmm. percent of you said Carter. Forty-three mm -hmm. percent of you said Dillingham. That's not that surprising. Um, should Isn't Isaiah? It? What? What do you find surprising there? That he it's such a wide margin over what many people perceive as the much more talented Dillingham. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, I just think that Heat fans love guys like Devin Carter. We've It's like part of that's, the DNA. We've fair. just been brainwashed to love Devin Carters, and that's why he's yeah. the one on our boards. Yeah, give me a guy with all the all-star <laughs> potential or just a grinder, you know? It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, okay, there you go. He just said everything. 
<laughs> yeah, I just want the guy that says the right things. Um, <laughs> should Isaiah Collier? I will say this about Dillingham. If there, there's, a, I see this a lot, and I like him. For the record, I had him high on. I had number five on my guy's big board. But if you're drafting him because you're worried that he's the next Tyrese Maxey, that's a really bad reason to draft him. Oh, either yeah, you've done it. the scouting, and you really are in on Dillingham because for every Tyrese Maxey, there's a Bones Highland, Ooh. right? And so if I don't, I don't think the front close. office has ever operated out of FOMO before. Like right. I don't think that's how they're ever going to be. Like no, 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 we messed up a couple of years ago. We got to make up for it. So I, I don't right. see that that's being the strategy that was, of the draft. That was more a uh, uh, message to the fans that if they don't draft them, don't be like, we just missed out on the next Maxi. Like you don't. Oh, it's going to happen. It'll happen for sure. <laughs> Unless they draft sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> should Isaiah Collier be on or off Miami's draft board? 57% of you said he should be on the board. Ooh. 43% of you said he should be off the board. He's off of my board, and I will deny that I, if they do draft him. Yeah. But... <laughs> um, that was a little yeah, surprising you, how many you, said been, he should be off. Because on the surface, all you hear is physical specimen, elite speed, power. He can get downhill, you know, kind of, again, to make your running back comparison, he's a he's a guy that can put rim pressure, and he just does so, so many of those things that a lot of Heat fans feel Miami needs offensively. But, it's, you know, the other things, though, that uh, – I've not been great. You hear about whether or not he's been, you know, skipping workouts, whether or not it was his decision or you know, a team that may have made a promissory note. I don't know how that's possible given Miami's history of not doing that. And the fact that I think publicly, right, he's still only the that's only the, the one team that he's worked out for. Yeah, I, I haven't I checked in on it. I'm not, but yeah, it was it was weird with him. I I don't know what he's trying to do with these workouts. Again, USC had a pro day. So maybe he mm-hmm. they and he was at the combine. So maybe he felt like he'd done enough. And for a guy like Collier, whose biggest question is three point shooting, it doesn't really make much sense to do individual workouts where he's going to just clank a bunch of shots off the rim and ruin his draft stock. So I understand him not wanting to do it. I don't understand why he only did it in Miami. Maybe he was the first one he did and realized this was a bad idea and I'm not going to do this again. I don't know, but um, yeah, for yeah. a guy who can't, you know, shoot, the heat he has historically- concerns about his defense. I don't. Yeah. I just don't know how he gets on the, the floor for Miami. He, this is a guy to me that's going to have to spend time in the G League, and he might be awesome. Like this was a guy in the his physical skills and his ability to get to the basket, bar none in this in this draft. So like, it wouldn't be like a complete shock if he were taken in the top fifteen somewhere, but it just doesn't sound like that's where his range is right now, based on some of the reporting around the draft. So, yeah, but I understand he, if you're historically a fan, you just want to take a swing at it. I get it. Historically, a franchise that just loves drafting guys that will avoid challenges at every opportunity you know that that just screams heat player right there it's this like is gonna oh look so, are you scared so of the moment they, it's gonna look so bad when they take them at 15 this is gonna look so bad at least it's at the end of the delete show. all these episodes so get those clicks in now because this won't be here in two days <laughs> um, we will be at the official miami heat draft watch party on wednesday the event starts at seven the draft starts at eight the heat pick at 15 we'll be there to talk with you give you guys what we think is going to happen and then recap what actually does happen. Uh, in the meantime, we'll have some more episodes for you before that. Thanks so much for listening to Locked On Heat, your first listen every day. Like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on your podcast app.